So here we are, um, DTS session 11. We're going to pick up where, where we left off. I'm going to reiterate a little bit because we've been gone a week. And by the way, I won't be here next week uh, again. I'm going to the Foursquare uh, Regional Conference to, to be part of that. And then um, I'll be back again for another week. And then off, I'll be out another week for board meetings in uh, Ohio. So anyway, we're playing hopscotch, but did you guys do okay in the, in the engagement project? Each one of those stands alone, and each one of them is full of truth. And I really want to encourage you to, to participate in those. Don't, don't not come. Come get fed and then and, and feed on the word with the engagement project. So here we are. We're, gonna, we're, we're talking about leadership, and uh, we're just going to reiterate, like I said, just a little bit to, to kind of bring us all up to speed. But... Um, Everything good in our, about our faith hinges on our understanding that all of us were made to be leaders. The minute you and I were born again, we were drafted into the service of the king, and we need to, we need to acknowledge that, that we gave up our personal rights to, to do what we wanted to do, just like a soldier uh, gives up his rights to do whatever he wants when he joins the service. He's there to do a job to protect people. So every good thing uh, about, about our, our faith is going to hinge on us understanding that we're all called to be leaders and we need to be good leaders. Uh, we talked about the fact that leadership is a matter of discovery, not invention. We don't invent leaders. We don't, what we're looking for is what God has inherently put in each one of us because we know that God gave us our residence. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6. This is probably one of the most important concepts of your faith that you'll ever, ever touch on. Um, inside of every one of us is something that God put down in there that we are about no matter what we do. So regardless of how the, the, the scenes of your life change, you are still about your resonance. And once you discover what your resonance is, you are beginning to live in the fullness of what God created you for. So it's very important. I've had this discussion probably a dozen times since we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. And um, when, you, when we can connect a person with what God made you to be, man, I'm telling you, life changes. So uh, we want to discover the things that God's put in us. Then we know that Jesus puts us in places to minister with that resonance. So God puts resonance in us. Jesus says, I'm going to make a way for that to be expressed through your life, whether your whatever your career is, it has nothing to do with, with being in the ministry. We're all called to be leaders and ministers. And Jesus then will put us in the place of, of being able to express our resonance. And then the Holy Spirit will give you the gifts to back it up. And those three things go together. And the best thing you can ever do for yourself is focus on that passage of scripture. I have it in reverse order. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4, 5, and 6. And once that starts getting down in the fabric of your soul, it can change everything. Uh, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that we're his workmanship created in Christ for the good works that he planned for us from, from before, before time. So we want to make sure that we discover what God has going for us. We don't want to invent our own leadership roles. Uh, good leadership is alignment with his purpose, John chapter 4. We believe here that Every leader and believer should be known as a devoted follower of Christ. You know, there's a bold statement that I opened up here that Paul makes, and, and you've got to grab the whole context in the chapter before and a little bit after, but, but can you imagine either the audacity or the conceit or the, the deep truth that's engaged in this statement? Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. I don't know about you, but if I was going to say be followers of me, I would hope there would be no takers. But now if you're going to be followers of me as I follow Christ, there's something of value there. So here's this guy, Paul, who's had these incredible experiences, and he, he tells this, this group of people that he's, he's really correcting uh, pretty sternly. He says, I want you to be followers of me even as I also am of Christ. And, and I want you to know we should all be known as devoted followers of Jesus. Amen. We should also be learning how to trust God in all things. None of us are ever going to trust God in everything all the time because we're not that perfect. We just sometimes can't, you know, keep our shoes tied during the day. Um, but the reality of it is, is that all of us should be striving to learn how to trust God in all things. And it should be having a profound effect on us, especially for the times we're living in. Um, I don't know when, I know soon we're going to be covering 
what this really looks like in practice. What, what does it look like in practical terms to trust God in the midst of all things? Every leader believer should be a model and safety for others who are watching, watching and following. And, and this is where we sort of were talking through the mentoring square. So we asked, who, who's following you? Because you need, to, you need mentoring to grow into, to become a leader. And anyone who's a growing leader should never stop being mentored. But you need to be willing to mentor people whose needs relate to you. And, and that's really where it's going to start. You're going to find people who are, somehow have, have homogeny with you. They have something in common with you. And that's where your earliest uh, times of mentoring are going to begin. Are we together? I mean, maybe you have a hobby, and people who have that same, that same avidity, that same hobby, they're going to draw close to you, and then your mentoring is going to, you're going to have opportunity for mentoring. So uh, not only do you need to recognize you need mentoring and need to continue in mentoring, but you also need to be willing to mentor someone, and, and it's a lot easier not to mentor anybody, right? It's a lot easier just to say, hey, I'm living my life, man. Just leave me alone. You know, go find your help somewhere else. But that's not what we were called for. We were called to be engaged with one another in all the directions. So we talked about the nine types of mentors, that there's a discipler and a spiritual guide, not the funky kind, not the crystal ball ooh, ooh, ooh thing, but spiritual guides, helping people understand what true spirituality is. We saw that there the, is the coach and the counselor, and there's the teacher, uh, the sponsor, big one, putting your name, putting your name out there for somebody it is expensive, personally expensive. You've got your own personal equity on the line. When you back someone and say, listen, I want you to, to receive them as you would receive me, that can be expensive. But you've got to be willing to do it. Amen? How about this? We saw that there was contemporary mentors. Uh, those are the ones who are still alive, still reasonably touchable, or they're active, still in ministry. Then there's historical mentors, those who've gone on before us. Spurgeon's a good thing. Jonathan Edwards, good example of historic uh, mentors. We read the materials, we go, wow, yeah, that really resonates with me. I want that. And then there's divine contacts. If we, if we get to, if we get to, someone's backstage, um, if we get to the intensive, I'm going to show you, I want you to see how many divine contacts God has sent you. I mean, there are people walking in your life all the time that if you aren't aware uh, that these people are actually mentors for you, you can miss some of the most profound twist turns of your life. So nine types. Then we, we, I told you that they came, those nine fit into three categories. There are, in, there are intensive mentors, the discipler, spiritual guide, and coast. The first three are intensive mentors. Then there are active mentors. These are not as intense, they're, but they're still there connected with you, counselor, teacher, sponsor. Then there's passive, and passive would mean that they're not actually engaged in your life, but somehow you're still relating to them by books, by articles, by podcasts. I mean, I listen to podcasts. I listen to other people's presentations all the time, Ann and I both. And it's just important because what it does is it, it gives you a well-rounded kind of input, and you can go, yeah, I don't agree with that, or yeah, whoa, I never, never saw that before. You've always got to be open to, to certain things. Now, I'm not talking about nonsense, okay? There's stuff that we hear on the radio. You go click, okay, I don't need to hear any more of that. I'm not talking about entertaining every conversation, but I'm talking about having people that you go, wow, that's a trustworthy word. And then you, you, you imbibe that in some kind of, uh, in some kind of um, uh, limited, limited fashion. So most people we talked about feel like there are no mentors for them. And if I asked you, if I took a poll and say, hey, uh, do you believe there's, there's someone out there to mentor you? Many of us would say, no, I don't, I don't think so, or, or they're too busy. Um, but I feel like there are no mentors, but with nine types, everybody can be mentored. Everybody, somehow, some way can be mentored. Now, here's some mentoring myths we talked about, that you have only one mentor in a life. That's not right. I've had dozens, dozens of them. I, I, I've had six business mentors who set up my business acumen, my, my, the, my operating uh, motto in business. Now, a lot of it, I, when I became saved, I had to spit out because it was all corrupt. I was, taught, I was taught in horrible things that had great benefits for the person who was willing to compromise their soul. <laughs> so, 
Anyway, uh, you have only one. That's not true. There's many mentors. Uh, they must be older than me. That's a myth. Your mentor doesn't have to be older than you. It could be somebody who's just had more life experience than you. The way that society we live in today, there are people living double, triple, quadruple lifetimes because everything's so jammed together. I mean, my generation had a kind of like a rhythm of life. And, you know, it could take, you had innocence and it could take you a long time to build up your personal experience that framed your world. But now, internet exposes us to everything and, and there's information coming at us that many times we don't even want to have. Uh, but there can also just be people who've lived those kind of lives, been converted, conversion is real, and now they can be a mentor to you. I've been there, I've done that. This, I want you to listen. I can help you through that. Are we together? Uh, mentor myth. I don't need anyone to help me. Not true. If, if that's your attitude, you're proving how badly you need someone like now. That's, that's just triage stuff. You need to be thrown down on the cot and we're going to cut you open so that we can pull out the bad stuff and stitch you back up with, a, with you know, carpet thread. Meatball surgery, Right? How about this one? Here's a myth. No one's qualified to mentor me. Oh, <laughs> really? Okay, well, I can think of a few people that we could send your way that will humble your soul. How about this? Uh, I'm not qualified to be one. Of course you are. Sharing your life experience is, is, is mentoring. Just sharing what you know. Every one of us is capable of being a mentor. And how about this one? They must be a Christian of the same theology as me. That's not true either. I was on the phone today with Rodney. We, we are great pe- uh, friends and very good peer mentors. And he has a different th- philosophy of life, a, a, a different philosophy of Christianity than I do. We agree on the big things that Jesus Christ is the Savior, that the Holy Spirit indwells us all, and we believe that Jesus is coming back. Those are the three things we agree on. And, and you know what? That's plenty, absolutely plenty for me to enjoy him, him and I in a peer mentorship. Um, I asked you about this exercise. Name some of your mentors. I, I hope you wrote them down. Did you write them down? Those of you who are here, you wrote down your, the names of your mentors? How about this? Which mentoring type were they? Did you answer the question? Did you, were you able to define your mentors? How about this? What kind of empowerment did they extend to your life? Um, a lot of my mentors really set me up for success. A lot of my mentors set me up for success being t- Terrible mentors. You learn sometimes more from horrible experiences of being mentored than you do from people who are willing to take you by the hand and walk out life with you. So very important to understand that, uh, that mentors come in all sizes and shapes. And are you answered yes to these things? How about the mentoring score? We looked at it. I just put the whole thing up there. We're not going to study it tonight. But I, we talked about you got to have a, an upward mentor. You've got to have peer mentors, active and passive. So you've got your group of friends, that's a group of mentors. You've got a group of people that are in your your own uh, uh, um, age bracket or in your life circumstance, and you've got to have them for objectiveness. And then you've got to be downward mentoring somebody. So we asked, where did you fit in all that? How many places are you connected in all that? And I hope you answered it. This This is for real stuff we're talking about. This is stuff that we want to change our, our, the level of our faith with our way together. So then we talked a little bit about four square mentoring, needing upward mentors to develop full potential. If you don't have an upward mentor, you're never going to be challenged enough. You're never going to have a, a high enough perspective to actually be fully developed. You need peer mentoring because you need loving friendships and accountability relationships. I, I am accountable to my friends. And, and you know what? It doesn't have to be, okay, well, I'll only let you be accountable. I'll, I'll let you hold me responsible only as much as I want to give you. That's ridiculous. My friends, will, my friends know me, and they'll go, uh, no. No, we're not going there. You're not going there. What do you mean? I can do whatever I want. Yeah, you can, but not without a fight. That's good mentoring. That's good peer mentoring, right? Uh, so you need peer mentoring in your group. You need external peer mentors because... That's where you don't get babied. That's where the person's giving you object, objectivity because they aren't connected. They're not going, oh, you poor baby. I feel so, they're going, hey, look, 
stand up on your two feet, slap the taste out of your mouth, and let's get down the road. Perspective, right? How about this? With Downward Mentoring, we're helping others. So we did a little exercise. Where am I plugged into the mentoring square? Where am I not plugged in? What kind of mentor have I been? What kind of mentoring haven't I experienced and why? We continue the exercise with this. Who will I ask to mentor me? Did you answer the question? How about this? Why them? What specific mentoring are you asking them for? How about when, where, and how will you approach those people that you're asking to mentor you? And who will I mentor and what will I offer them? Now, we got pretty close to, to this slide when we started to run out of time. Crazy how fast it went in that last, that last half. So we're going to kind of pick up from here. So we want to be good mentors, right? We're going to mentor somebody. And it, you have a choice of being a good mentor or a bad mentor. It's kind of like being a leader in Christianity. When you got saved, you became a leader. You're either going to be a good one or you're going to be a bad one. You're going to be a good steward of what Christ gave you or a bad steward. You're going to be one. You just got to choose which one, right? Good or bad. So we need to teach our interns to accept responsibility for their growth because you are not their God. And that's very important for you to understand. Mentoring does not mean you get to tell people what to do. Mentoring means that you're pouring something in them and that you are literally pointing them to God for the outworking of what it is that you're pouring into them. People ask me up for my, my input all the time. And you know what? All I'm responsible for is answering the question. I'm not responsible for their behavior. They have to make their own decisions. It's between them and Jesus. Are we together? We need to be, if we're going to be good mentors, we need to help people see the unique gifting. And it's pretty hard for us to help them see their unique gifting if we haven't understood our unique gifting. You really got to deal with that 1 Corinthians 12 issue. Resonance. What is it you're about? How about this? We help them discover and develop God's goals for their lives, not their goals. You're going to have people all the time who are going to say, well, here's what my goal is. Can you mentor me in a way that I can get what I want? Don't do it. Be on guard. You're not there to help them get what they want. You're there to help them get what God wants. If you're a good mentor, amen? Uh, good mentors involve other mentors who can help meet other their people's needs. Um, don't ever become anybody's end-all, be-all. You make sure that if you run up against something, that you include other people. It helps, it helps spread out the, the load, and it also keeps anybody from, from getting too tightly attached. Help them see that every bit of input that comes into life is Father's sovereignty at work in their submitted lives. So what that means simply is this. Um, person is, is, has a hard word. That's, that, that's the Lord's sovereign work in your life. That's, that's uh, the uh, um, Romans 11, uh, 22 passage. Is, is that right? Doesn't sound right. It's the, it's the behold the goodness and severity of God. Severity on those who are rebellious. Goodness to those who are repentant. We, we call it one of our core values that's developed from, from that passage is we're one degree harder than, than the most rebellious and one degree softer than the most repentant. If you approach any of our team with a repentant heart or, or softness and you're tru truly willing to listen and learn, you're going to find big, strong arms holding you tight and getting to you to where you're going to go. You approach us with that, that you know, I already know everything uh, thing or I, I don't care what you guys have to say. You're going to find granite. People come to it. You'll be surprised. People will come to you all the time for you to justify their desires. Tell me it's okay to get a divorce. Tell me it's okay for me to, to, to spend my money on drugs. You, they're going to ask you for all kinds of things to, for you to affirm in them. Well, this time for hardness. And if it's hard, they have to understand that that's still God at work, even when they don't like the answer. Huh? Okay. We've got to teach people how to remain teachable. You've got to help them understand I know you don't like that, or I, I think that you just, you love that, and now you want more of it. You just got to teach them to be, be teachable people. So here's where we left off. I'm pretty sure. 
Good mentors, listen to these, these statements. Good mentors keep people focused on our Father as their source. And they send them to Him when the mentor E gets frustrated. If you mentor anybody, including your kids, you know this is for real. You can tell your kids the right thing in the world to do, and man, they are just frustrated. Why can't you ever tell me anything that I want to hear? <laughs> well, because you're not too smart. Huh? So when they get frustrated, they're going to want to take it out on you. Take it on, you point them right back to God. You have a problem with this? I get it. I've had plenty of problems with godly input, so tell you what. You take it back to him, and you ask him what is and isn't right. Nah, I don't want to do that. Well, we know why, right? How about this? Good mentors. Don't let people put undue stress on their mentoring relationship. Because if you have to quit mentoring because they're putting too much stress on, your, on you personally or on your marriage or on your family time, if you have to quit, then there's no mentoring, so just keep it in check. Right? Right? You see it? Okay, so that leads to this. And this is a law. Good mentors, watch out for the law of propinquity. Propinquity is a scientific law. You take two, two bodies, two bodies of anything, two masses of anything, and if you put them into close relational co connection for long enough they will gravitate to one another and they will start to bond. A mentor, I've seen this a hundred times and I've been part of it three times. A mentor can get drawn into a relationship that is unhealthy and it risks everything. Risks everything. I am still doing, I'm still doing damage control today for a relationship gone wrong in 1974. A soul tie was developed. I was still a brand new Christian. I didn't get all this, you know, right off the bat. I was involved in a relationship with a little gal, led her to the Lord, got her filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized her in water, and we just had a good relationship surrounding painting a life-size picture of Jesus in my, one of my stores. What could be a better thing to do than that? And we ignored the law of propinquity. And when I, when I said, this, that, that's it, it's over, done. We were this close. And knowing my own, my own composition, I was this close to being thrown out of ministry for good. I would have never, I would have never recovered. I would have never let myself recover. I can forgive you of anything. Can't forgive me of, of the, what was hap about to happen the sexual sin that was about to happen. You get drawn in soul ties, and if you let that go long enough, you're finished. So this is a law. I'm just telling you, as your pastor, as your friend, we're called to mentor. It's part and parcel of our lives. If you ignore this law, you're going to get washed down the drain. Huh? Okay. Good mentors. Have clear guidelines for accountability and communication, confidentiality, duration, and reevaluation. Re you don't want to ask me to mentor you if you don't want uh, transparency of communication. And that means I'll tell the story over and over and over again to anybody who will listen if I think it'll help them. And you're going, well, wait, I thought that was confidential. I'm sorry. When it comes to, when it comes to things of the kingdom of heaven, there's, there's only the things that help people, and those things always have to be out in the clear. That'll weed, that weeds them out quick, right? You've got to have all these things established. So if you're the kind of person who says, you know what, I'll keep, this, I'll keep this quiet to my grave, that better be a clear guideline that is established between you and them. If, if it's, you know, um, I, want to, I, I want to set this up, we'll do this for three months. We don't counsel anybody. We don't draw near to anybody for much longer than, than three months. We don't counsel longer that, than that at all. If we can't help people in two, three, four sessions, we're done. Send them to somebody who can help them. Because obviously we're not the ones who are going to get through. See the guidelines? 
You got to have guidelines so that things don't go wrong when you intend to do everything well. You want to do the right thing for God. But man, I'm telling you what, our enemy is a sneaky snake and he knows exactly what your, what your, your uh, areas of weakness are and he will exploit them. And here's what he'll do. He'll exploit it at the most embarrassing moment or when it's the greatest collateral damage possible. You got to have clear guidelines in mentoring. How about this? Begin mentoring with the end in sight. No mentoring should be indefinite. Bring closure to each segment. So good mentors, uh, they know this, that the difference between mentoring and coaching is in mentoring, you're putting something in, which is good. That's, you're, you're pouring out of your own life into them. And, and coaching is drawing something out of them. And, and it's important for you to understand maybe you're not the person who's going to put something in. Maybe you're the person that God's setting to, to draw something out. So make sure that you've got clear, clear understanding of the differences of what you're there to do. A good mentor knows the joys and the risks of sponsorship. I've, I've done this several times. There, there, I, I, don't often, I don't often back a person with my, on my own equity. But I do it because it's part of the kingdom. But the reality of it is, is that a lot of times that, that has been a, a very painful experience. Okay. That's what life's about. It's about bearing pain. And you don't pull back because it's painful. You just understand that people are people. The world is what it is. There's no fairy tale. There's no Camelot. And you're going to pay the price. Just understand there's joy and there's risk. And be willing to em- embrace the joy and to pay the tab on the risk. Amen? Are we connecting? Okay, how about this? Good mentor knows the potency and importance of being a divine implant. So the Lord sends you in, or uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. So the Lord says to you, I want you to step into so-and-so's life. And you go, oh, no, not me, Lord, not me. And we do, first we do the backpedaling, you know, the Moses thing. Not me, I don't know what to say. Don't ever say that to the Lord. He'll turn you into a talking mule. Or, you know, Lord, I really have a hard time with them. Okay, now for sure you're going to get that assignment. Because the Lord knows that you've got, you've got an issue that needs to be, be ironed out. You have to know how important it is. Because one person, now you, you understand this scientifically and astrologically, or astronomically, I should say. Yeah, it, it, astrology wasn't always bad what it is today. But, but one degree on a trajectory, one degree, can, depending upon how far out a person is, can change a course forever. You are set by God in many cases to have nothing else to do than just be a divine implant for a moment to help a person get their trajectory changed. And we want to make sure that the change is a good change. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody here ever been to been the, the, the implant point for a bad change in someone's life? And you said, oh man, I wish I could take that back. I wish I'd have never said that. I, I, I wish I had been wiser, right? We all know what that's like. So we want to make sure that we do it in a way that's healthy. So <clears throat> you'll never be the best that you can be until you're surrounded by great people and you'll never be more blessed than when you know they're good, they're, they're great because you help mentor them. That is such a privilege of our Christian faith, to be good mentors to other people. Amen? Any questions on the mentoring thing before we move? Yes? Okay, so you pointed out the difference between mentoring, putting something in, and coaching, drawing something out, but is there, a, like, what about as a teacher? Like, is there a difference? I know you're imparting stuff, but I, I'm not sure. Is it a, when you're a teacher, is it kind of a combination of both? Um, <clears throat> I guess it could be, Dana. Uh, the question is, is there's a difference between um, coaching and mentoring. And then in the case of the mentor being a teacher, which one is that? I, I guess it would, it would really depend on the individual relationship. But a teacher in this case of mentoring is a person who's just downloading a greater body of truth. And normally that would be the truth from the, from the word, from the logos. And, and it would be sort of like generalized. Whereas a mentor is very specific. 
And a coach is looking for an attribute to rise. So teaching is a little bit more broad. Good question, though. Anything else? Yes. A, a, a set of guidelines for when a mentorship is ending. Um, okay. <laughs> here's, how, here's how I failed at, at the one I was just talking about a moment ago. I was confronted by the Lord of knowing the right trajectory. I had to, I had to stop what was happening and get up and, and go. I did my, my best to explain this is why I'm doing this. And, and this is for my good and for your good. And I tried to be very, you know, I tried to explain very well. A person, if it's a bad ending, if it's an exit rather than kind of like a glide down, boy, I don't know how to, to say that there's a good, a simple way. Because like I said, I've been paying for this since 1974, 75 and it's been a heartache for me. It's something I visit regularly. And, but on a good mentorship, what you'd be doing would be more, more like a graduation ceremony. It would be the mentality of, hey, you know what, Bill, Susie, I, no, no, no. You know what, Bill? It should be male on male, female on female. It helps, helps with the laws of propinquity. But you can have a bromance that can mess with your marriage. You can have a sister. What, what do you guys call it? What, what do sisters call it? Huh? BFF. Yeah, my BFF. You can have, I, oh yeah, you know what? That's great. I know plenty of BFF relationships that have become an absolute divider in a marriage. Just destroyed them. And in, oh, I can't go there, Lord, please. Uh, you got to be real careful. Talking about a good, a good yes, it's a graduation. You've done a great job. We've had a good, good conversation. I really feel like that you have, you know, your feet on the ground and your head's focused on Jesus. Uh, and so our time is coming to an end. But I want you to know I'm available for a phone call. I'm available for, for coffee sometime. But, you, but the relationship is, is starting to break down in its intentionality. And then you don't do nothing. You find the next person to mentor. Uh, don't ever stop doing something. The devil loves people who have the mentality of, I've done my part, now it's time for someone else to do their part. Man, if I fall off a horse, I'm going to get back on the horse. And, and you've got to make sure that you're always, because we understand the nature of our imperfection, you have to always be pushing forward into what's next. That's what Paul was talking about in Philippians 3. I don't know why God wanted me, but this one thing I do, I'm going to strive to understand what his will is for my life. I'm going to see everything that I've done in the past as past, and I'm going to lean into, press toward the mark of the high calling I have in Christ. So don't ever stop. I, I just p posted this the other day in one of my, one of my um, uh, Facebook posts. For Anna and I, like vacation time or time away from the church, is just like one of those loop-de-loo things. You know, like the little uh, Hot Wheels cars we used to have, or they have those in real life. I mean, real life, kind of crazy. But, but you're on a track, and all you're doing is the track itself loops, but it comes right back onto the same place where you were. So when, when you're on this track of, of in, working as a soldier, can you imagine a soldier saying, hey, commander, I know that when I enlisted, I signed that on the dotted line and I gave you my life and, and swore my fealty to our country and to our God. But you know, there's a lot of other guys here. And I don't really feel like doing anything anymore. I, you know, I didn't really particularly like boot camp. And so I feel like I have a, have a little break coming. And besides that, the sergeant was a little mean. I can tell you what you'd be doing. You'd either be peeling potatoes the rest of your life or you'd be running your laps the rest of your life. You'd have a horrible experience. Don't get tricked by the devil, please. You stay in the game no matter what. I'm not just talking about working in church. I'm talking about you make sure you are moving ahead 
all the time. Stagnation is your biggest enemy because the world seduces you to think you've done your part. Take a break. We've got pastors today. I don't want to get sidetracked, but we've got pastors today that they're thinking more about their next vacation than they are about their ministry. I want you to know that those congregations are doomed because that is not the mindset of a person in pastoral ministry. People in pastoral ministry, we swore fealty and I feel sorry for the next generation. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I really don't. But a whole new breed ought to better rise up soon because they don't have a clue of what it means to be in the ministry. That's just a job. And we have the same rules and we look for the same benefits packages and we compare ourselves to the other people. That's not the ministry. And that's not the ministry of the individual believer at all. You just stay in the game. Are we together? Thank you for the question. What else? Any other questions before we move? Yes. Yeah. That would fall under the, uh, what the, what the question was about was, you can have relationships that aren't healthy. Entering things that just turn into gab sessions and, and gossip sessions or picking on one another. Uh, and that's really not what mentoring is about. This isn't picking on one another, this is helping to perfect one another. And so what that means is, even if you have a criticism to make of someone, you're, you're literally pushing them toward the answer. You're not just saying, hey, you know what? I don't know what to even say about that. I don't, because I don't mention it that way, but you're ugly. What am I supposed to do without that? I don't know. That's a lousy mentor. You've got to do something to help people, right? So, so you've just got to make sure that that's part of your, we've set our guidelines. And, you know, I feel like when we get together that we're talking too much about, and this will kill it right off the bat. The second you confront a person on those kind of relationships, they're done. Because they don't want to be confronted. They just want to have somebody to, you know, offload their garbage on. I use, I use the illustration of I, my friend would not be the guy who pulls up to my house, backs up his garbage truck, and dumps his load on my front lawn. That's not my friend. Right? So you got to make sure you don't have those kind of friends. Um, if people want to wanna help a person dump off their garbage, take them to the garbage dump. Good. You know what? I can see that you're grieved. I can see that you've got a lot, of, a lot of baggage you're carrying around. Tell you what let's do. Let's take your stuff to the dump and leave it where it belongs with the one who did it to you. And let's go to God to get refreshed. That's good mentoring. Amen? That help? Okay. What else? Kat, do you have your hand up? It, say it again, honey. So, a spouse mentoring his spouse or her spouse? Between a husband and wife? Well, that's automatic because the two of you are one. So, any, any marital relationship? Oh, this, this is a good question because you're hitting on a big topic. I just had this the other day. Who was that? The, the husband will take mentoring from anybody, but won't take mentoring from his own spouse. That's it. That, it wasn't anybody here, but, but that's a huge problem because that goes right to the core of not understanding even why you're married. And, and the bottom line is, is that mentoring between husband and wife is automatic. And it's not only mentoring, it's coaching. You know, somebody will have, a husband will have a life experience that can mentor a wife through um, uh, 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 an experience of, of life right now. But, but that w same gal could, could say, I have experience with this and I, you need to hear what I have to, to put in you. Like, for example, in Anne in my life, I, I've lived a lot longer than her. And so, uh, yes, I robbed the cradle. Um, 
And so I can mentor her through life experiences. But you know where my wife mentors me? It's like, you know what, Siri? <laughs> you, you are really like a little too hard on this issue. And it's not talking about the word, but a little too hard. You need to be a little bit more compassionate. No, I don't. Who do you think you are? I would never say that. We have too many knives at my house. But you understand what I'm saying? See it? So you see, cat mentoring and coaching. We coach each other all the time. And so in the marriage relationship, it's 100% right. Um, and the only thing that would be negative is if you guys haven't, and not you guys, but a husband and wife, haven't dealt with the rules of engagement. It's very important that you've set up the rules of engagement, how we talk to one another. And when I talk to you, what does that mean? Um, for the first year of our marriage, I was just talking to my wife like I was talking to my friends. And I was rolling over her with a, steam, with a steamroller. And I, I, would, I would wonder, why did she take that that way? What's going on? I had no rules of engagement. We were still too new. But as, we, as I began to realize, I'm hurting my own wife, which means I'm hurting myself. Two are made one. You can't, you can't yell at your wife without, without bringing darkness in your own life. Your, your wife can't make, make selfish demands on you without destroying your own future. You got to understand that how, what that is. You're too, you're, it's like taking a quarter and heads on one side, tails on the other side. It's the same quarter. Slash at it if you want to. You're not hurting anybody but the two of you, right? Oh, we're going into marriage counseling here. Anyway, anyway, the reality of it is, is that husbands and wives, you've got to have rules of engagement. And you've also got to have the stops, wherever the stops are. This is James chapter 3, verse 16. You've got to have the stops set in place. We're going to talk through this up to this point. And when we hit this point, done. If we aren't agreed by this point, no one's going to get thrown off a cliff and no one's jumping off a cliff. We're going to stop right here. And if, I wish we could see it like that. I wish we could see it like when we're, when we're in contest with one another, that you might as well just have a big, a big pool of sharks. And one, one more word. You say one more word. Clink. You're shredded. You should have those rules. We have those rules. And I'm not going to do a marriage seminar right now, but I want to tell you something. I've had 41 years of peace and sanctuary in my home. It has never one time been ripped up because we had rules. And someone taught the same thing to us. A mentor taught this to us. Amen? Can we move, move to the next topic? We're running out of time. I'm, I'm so, I, this is too much fun. I could do this forever. Could you? Yeah. Okay, sure. So I want to, yes. To be a mentor, there has to be an agreement. So if there's an agreement, absolutely. But the agreement has to be based on love and respect and, and the desire to be perfected. Yeah. You can mentor anybody in the world, but just make sure that you don't, you don't um, break the rules. Okay? All right. Uh, this is an important one to me when it comes to being a good mentor and a good, a good leader and a good Christian because I believe that we're called not only to have private conversations, but to have have potent conversations. So, reaching out to touch somebody. That's the old commercial. Reach out and touch someone. I, don't, I think that's what it was. So this is a mini instruction on the art of communication. Okay? So, in all communication, there needs to be a beginning, middle, and a close. And it needs to become natural to you. In mass communication, it's even more important to know what to say, how to say it in a way that everyone knows what you said. Right? Because all of us have things we want to say. But sometimes we don't take the, 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 the time to figure out how do we say that. Now, remember when Paul said, I become all things to all men, 
This is, this is what he's talking about. I'm going to com- I got to communicate to this group with an understanding of where the group is. I got to communicate with this group differently than this group because they can't hear the same thing that this person is going to hear. And it, if it's the same material, it has to be packaged so they can hear and so on and so forth. So communication is important. So we're going to talk about dialing in. Before you can talk to someone, you got to know their number, right? This is just, we're playing off of the metaphor of the of telephone. I know we don't do this anymore. We don't dial the phone. But, but you have to know their number. So if I'm going to speak to this crowd, I'm going to speak a certain way. If I'm going to speak to this crowd, I'm going to change it. When I speak to an atheist or an agnostic, I have a totally different, different rhetoric for them. Completely different. Because they don't know Christianese. It's confusing to them. We have our code words, right? We get it. But I have a totally different set. For people who are at a certain level of faith that I can recognize, I can speak differently to them than I can to someone who's brand new to the faith. So the reality of it is you got to know someone. you got to know who you're talking to. Know your audience. It's just an old, old adage. Know who you're talking to, okay? So let's dial. Number one. Dialing number one. People really want you to tell them something powerful and life-changing. They do. There's not a person that you know that you've met that doesn't want you to tell them something powerful and life-changing for them. Not for you, for them. They want it. You know why? Because they're sick and tired of life the way that it is. You can count on the reality that in every human being, there's an impulse going off. You know, kind of like the, 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 the signal that independent, on Independence Day that the aliens were sending out. It doesn't ever let us go. It never lets us alone. And if you can't hear yours anymore, you need to come back to the Lord and say, I have grown dull of hearing. My eyelids are heavy. My heart has grown fat. God has put in all of us a desire for our homeland, for our previous creation um, context and fulfillment. So people are looking for people to tell them something that is life-changing and powerful, right? Number two, people really want you to do a good job telling them something powerful and life-changing. It, it, it can be so, you can have the best thing in the world to say, but if you can't get to the point, if you're going to run every rabbit trail, and it's just, this, these are just things that can be easily fixed. You've got to have a, a way, an ability to say, this is what I'm going to say, and I'm going to get there to the quickest point, uh, distance between two points is what? A direct line. Just get to the point. They want to hear something powerful and life-changing, and they want you to do a good job telling them. Number three, people really want you to key in on them not you. They want you to key in on them, watching them very closely for all their nonverbal signals. If you've got a person that you're talking to and you're ignoring their signals, like you want to stop and you want to, what was that about? I, all the time in counseling, all the time, the second that I see the eyes get, get misty, I always, I stop. You know what I, why? Tell me, tell me why, tell me why that's so close to the surface underneath your skin. Tell me why that, that, that affected you that way right there. What is that that's propelling you? They want you to tell them something powerful and life-changing, but they don't want to spiel. They want, to, they want an engagement, and that means you've got to be willing to read them and watch them very closely. This is a horrible thing, but the era of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, did a lot of people a lot of good as far as counseling went. And if you know anything about NLP and you keep it straight, it can help you pick up cues by where people look when you're talking to them, left, looking up to the left or to the right or looking down. I mean, this is natural stuff, but, but there's, a, there's a science behind it that ha- can help you. So they want you to read them. Number four, people want to hear how your real life was powerfully changed. They, they don't want... Um, theories or, you know, high-sounding principles. They want to know, how was your, so you're telling me this, so how was your life changed by this? Well, it wasn't. I just read about it in a book. Oh, well, thank you. Give me the book next time, right? So they want to hear how, you real, how your real life has probably changed. Number five, 
the people you're dealing with today are pretty sophisticated. And by that, I just mean they're pretty worldly. So, so make sure that you're talking to them in terms that, that are relevant and that they get. Right? Number six, people like it when you identify with them. You're listening to the story, you listen to what's going on, and you have the ability to show sympathy or empathy. Those two are incredibly powerful forces. Sympathos or empathos. Those come to us directly out of Scripture. They want to know, can you feel it or have you felt it? And if you felt it and you got out of it because something wonderful happened to you, something changed your life, I want to, I want to know that. They like it when you identify with them and you're speaking their language. Number seven, people are the reason that you and I were left here and we're called to be leaders. Don't ever see the people around you as a hindrance. You're in my way. Come on. Give me a break. Okay, take people out of your picture. What do you have left? Nothing of value. Oh, I got peace. That's false peace. You're not fulfilling a purpose. You're just taking up space. We exist for people. That's why Jesus left you here after salvation. If, if peace was the goal, if heaven was the goal, the minute you accepted Jesus, you would have died. You would have fallen, fallen out and died. Now, that wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing for us, right? But he left you here on purpose. And what was the purpose? The people who were in the room. People in your life. You were left here for them. Husband, wife, children, friends, people that work, people you go to church with, people you shop in the stores with, you were left here for, the, for people. Do we, can we agree on that? What other great thing are you going to accomplish that's going to mean anything to God? Well, Lord, I, I, I closed the biggest deal. He goes, you'd be so proud. Where is it? Show me where it is. Well, I built the biggest skyscraper. That was my deal. Skyscraper with my, na- with my name on the monument. Where is it, Siri? Where is it? Well, you know, my 44, we were, at the, we were in Maine last week, and there was a boat that really resembled the, 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 uh, my Morgan 44 that I, that I was getting ready to, to sail around the world in. And it was kind of like, got to fight that one back because it means nothing. Where is it in heaven? Where's my boat in heaven? It burnt up in ash on the earth. Huh? Are we together? So, we're the people are the reason we're left here. Nothing else in this life really makes a difference for anything. Number eight, people need you to be clear in your speech and have your target in sight at all times. Um, don't be like me. That's the best way I can illustrate this. Because I can talk like this all day long and go down a thousand rabbit trails with you and come back and pick up where we left off. And you know what? It's, it's, it's great for taking notes but it's not wonderful for face-to-face contact solving a problem, right? People don't want to know all the things that I, that I have to share. We call it aspect speaking. When, when you speak, I have, a, I have a 50-year history to share, 50 years. How would you like if I got up somewhere and said, okay, on day one, on December 9th of 1973, and then I go, and on day two, December 10th, and then December 11th, you can't, you can't share that stuff. And I know plenty of people who try to tell their whole life story to everybody every time they show up. Hey, how's it going? Fine. Want to hear my story? And no. <laughs> I want to hear an aspect of your story. Uh, tell, me something that, tell me something that's important to you. Tell me something I can help you with. Let me tell you something that's important. Aspects. We speak in aspects. It's dim- the facets on a diamond. A diamond without facets is pretty much useless to the wearer. Could you imagine walking around with a 10 carat diamond on your finger that's never been, never been cut, just came out of the ground? Hey, what, what's that rock on your finger? What is that? A, is that a crystal? What is that? Glass? What is, it's beautiful because it gets cut into facets. Tell your story in facets. You know why? It makes the jeweler's cut sparkle. Your jeweler's the king. And he's cut your life in ways that everybody wants to see that sparkle. Share your sparkle. Share your facet. Don't kill anybody with the lump of, on your finger. Amen? Number nine. The people you're talking to are accustomed to thinking that they're thinking for themselves. 
modern media has convinced people that they're smarter than they are. So just make sure that you're aware that they're trying to think ahead of you, trying to get an answer ahead of you for the response. Just be patient. Just work with what they're giving you back. Listen to what they have to say because it'll tell you right where they are. And then number 10, people love listening to unprofessionals. Here's, here's my, this is my favorite point. I know you're not going to believe this, but it's 100% true. People out there would rather listen to you and 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 you. They'd rather listen to you tell them one facet of their story than to hear a person like me, who's a professional kingdom person, share the story. Because they expect me to share the story. They expect me to do everything I can to persuade them to yield their life to Christ. You know what blows their mind? When someone that they've known from maybe childhood, I know you, I grew up with you. That's what made it so easy for me to minister to my friends. When they saw the ridiculous amount of change in my life, they're like, oh, this has got to be real, man. This has got to be God because we know you. They want to hear your story more than they want to hear a line from me. And you need to be comfortable with that. You need to see yourself as important, vitally important to the kingdom of heaven. You need to understand, and I, I, I don't like using the word, but it's the only word I know. You need to understand the consinity of God, the genius of God to create you where you are and who you are and paint you the way that you're painted it's genius for him to do that. And you need to honor him for that. You need to honor him by speaking up, telling your story, and loving people. Amen? Amen. That's the communication segment. Um, any questions on the communication segment? No? That's because I was really clear. I had my target in sight. And I went for it. Right? Right? Yes, Steve. Is there any way that we can dial into anything between this? Yes. Because it's so many concepts at once. Yes. Um, first of all, it's online. It's, it's live online. I mean, video. But also, on the same page, you can download the notes, which are the slides. And I, you guys know why we do this, right? We do this so that you can preach any part of the messages that you want. I mean, that's why we go to all this. And all of our teachers do the same thing. We all use media because hearing it gives you 10% retention. Hearing it and seeing it gives you about 60% retention. And then giving you the notes gives you 100% retention if you want to do the work. So we want, you to, we want you to be successful at communicating any of the things that you see. So yes, sir, it's available in many forms and if you, if you need more than that, we'll figure out a way. Anybody else? Yes? Um, do you have any resources that you can point us to to become better communicators? Or like, better communicators? Yeah. Um, I'm sure that there are a lot, Dana. I'm, I, 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 you know what? I, I, do, a, I do a segment um, with people who, who speak from the, like a podium or something or from a platform, whatever it is. Um, you know, just real quickly, it's important to identify your speaking style, whether it's linear. So um, you'll, you'll start with a, with a premise and you'll just speak in a long line and then you come to a conclusion. Um, a lot of people speak that way. There are people who speak in a sawtooth. Uh, we call them digressions. Like, for example, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, um, a, an idea of what a digression sawtooth speakers like um, there's a brown cow down the street uh, behind a fence that's, that's kind of linear a digressive says there's a brown and when I say brown I don't mean chocolate brown I'm kind of like talking about coffee with cream in it you know brown and it's a, it's a brown cow now when I say the word cow I don't actually mean you see I don't actually mean just like a standard cow. I mean like a, a real cow. And you would identify whatever that would be because I have no idea what, what cows are. So except for milk givers or something. And so then you would say, 
He's down the street. Now, when I say down the street, I don't mean like just at the end of the driveway. I mean like probably 462 yards down the street. And he's down there and he's, he's standing next to a fence. And when I say fence, I don't mean just a typical fence. Because there's so many, you know. There's privacy fences in there. I'm talking about a wire fence, but not just a plain wire fence. That's digressive. And there's a lot of people. Jack Hayford, my mentor, my, 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 my contemporary mentor, and, and actually my, my, my active mentor, we could take, any one of us who were students, we could take one of his messages and develop a 15-part series on it. Because he was a digressive speaker. And you're like going, how in the world do you remember all that stuff? But he was a genius. And so he, he, people who are very brainy tend to be digressive speakers. And then there are people who are kind of like me, and there's, no, no, it, it, I'm a circular speaker. I like to start at a point, and I like to build, build those, I, and I use the beauty of three, and that's a standard, standard speaker's uh, thing, a standard of three, and that, just so you know, whoever you are, whenever that you're speaking, that's always the golden rule, that if you hold it to three, you'll have the greatest success of, of communicating clearly to your hearer. Because what, what, do we, what do we learn from childhood? One, two, three. Three strikes, you're out. Um, it's as easy as one, two, three. We're groomed. I don't know. Maybe it's something to do with, the, with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I don't know. But we're, we have this thing that they call the beauty of three. So don't overload people. Oops. Like this. Um, but, but, um, so there's that kind of speaker. So identify your gift, your, your speaking style first. Uh, the biggest problem with, with most of us who are learning how to speak is that we have too many, um, mental pauses that we put sound to. And that always sounds like, um, and then I was on here and, um, and then we were going and then, um, yeah, those are very irritating to the ear. And then we have the famous, anytime you're speaking to somebody, always be aware of your hands. I don't mean you can't speak with your hands because you can. But I, I had a pastor who, he had a very large proboscis nose. And he would, in, inevitably, he'd be talking and he'd go, <laughs> and you could hear it in the microphone and you could see it. And you were hoping nothing came out. And it was always distracting. It would always pull your attention away. And he'd be going, you're in the middle of sharing the most beautiful truth, and I can't focus because of that. Um, we had a, a precious brother named Art in our church in those days, and Art had a nervous habit. When he stood up in front of people, his nose would run. And I'm not talking about, like, run. I'm talking about strands would run. Well, pfft, the minute Art stood up, we all just went, did this. Okay, I'm, I'm listening as hard as I can, but I know what's happening. And, and it, was, it was just awful. So the rule was, don't be your own worst distraction. Always know where you are. I've seen men hitch up their pants. And I, you know what I'm talking about, right? I've seen men have an itch that... <laughs> you're like, just close the thing right now. Just shut the thing down. Because no one's going to get anything past that. Right? I, how about, don't, don't laugh at the men, girls... Because we, we know what happens when the wire is hurting you. you. I mean, you're your own worst enemy. You just wrapped up the whole thing. Let's, let's all just take a break. We'll get a co coffee and come back next month. Right? I'm just being honest. What's that? Well, yeah, yeah. That's why I was being, being facetious on purpose. Okay. Okay. Um, I, there's no possible way for me to get through the next section. No possible way whatsoever. So I'm just going to introduce it to you. Uh, no, I can't do it. Uh, get, take, write, down, write down the scripture. Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. This is about us getting on the field. So we'll open up here in two weeks. I won't be here next week, as you remember. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they moved to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel. And they lodged there before they passed over. 
And after three days, the officers went through the group and they said, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priest bearing it, then you will get up and follow after it. But leave a space between you and it. Don't get too close so that you may know the way by which you must go. For you have not passed this way before. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I want you to read the passage over and over and over. And I want you to see what you pull out of it. I want, I want you to just kind of like study it out and see how close we come when we talk about it next time we're together. And let's see what you come up with. Let's see what I came up with. And we'll compare notes. Amen? So we'll stop right here. Any questions before we go tonight? Any questions at all? Yes, Dimitra. Loudly, please. Okay, so, so that's a great question because it goes to a couple things. First of all, because you've been with us so long, I can just use, and I know you're comfortable with this. You could be in our church and I could be your contemporary passive mentor, which means we don't actually have a relationship, although we do for, have for years. Um, I could be your contemporary uh, mentor. So you wouldn't have to ask me. You're just, you're just taking in what's, what's being given out. And then I would be, I would feel probably the uh, discipler and teacher, let's see, what, yeah, discipler and teacher category as a contemporary uh, mentor for you. If you wanted like Anne to men mentor you, you would approach her and you would say, you know, Anne, I just, I, I, this is what I'm feeling from the Lord. And I just want to ask you the question, would you or could you, and w would you be willing to take that before the Lord and ask him if, if this if works? A lot of times, one of the things that we really miss in mentoring is that in Jesus' day, mentoring meant that the one who wanted to be mentored literally shut down everything to go be with the one they wanted to be mentored by. This is what young people did in the Jewish tradition. They would pick a mentor, <clears throat> they would pick a rabbi that they wanted to, to follow after his shmika. That was his, his specialty. So maybe there was a mercy guy. Maybe there was a, a law guy. Maybe there was a, uh, uh, you know, a grace guy. And so they would say, that's who I want to be like. And they would just literally go there. And they had the ability to take care of the person or the family would take care of the kid financially while the kid was there. And they would just be in the presence of the mentor the whole time. Uh, they called it being covered in my rabbi's dust. And... and um, those days are pretty hard to do this now. So there's a, it's a rather different situation, but um, mentoring today can take place practically with maybe a meeting for coffee once a week or every, once every two weeks. And then you have an intentional set of things to talk through as a mentor. And Say it again. Or, oh, sure, what, or what would, would, tell me what you think, what the scripture says about this. That's a great thing, too. Thanks for pointing that out. It's always got to be scriptural mentoring. We are newthetic Christians, newthetic counselors, newthetic mentors. And the word newthesis or newthetic means N-O-U thesis. And that means this. This is the new thesis that we receive from heaven to whereby we live. So mentoring isn't just a matter of saying, hey, you know what my opinion is? You should drive a Chevy. Uh, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you should drive a Dodge because God drove them out in a fury. Oh. Ha! Great way to end the session. Let's all stand together. All right. Well, Father, we want to say thank you for the night. Thank you for the time we've had together. Uh, it's been a great night, Lord. Thanks for the spirit of the of God just being here with us. We so appreciate what you're trying to accomplish in all of us. And we just want to yield, 
yield ourselves to it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.